Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Katie, and the ladybug tap dancing la cucaracha next to me is my co-host, Ellen. La cucaracha, la cucaracha, tippity 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 tap. Very nice. Thank you. I was trained to tap dance with my mouth. <laughs> Let's just keep rolling into the rolling rehash. Mm-hmm. Last week, we covered chapter 33 and the corresponding film scenes. Voldy feels like a trip down backstory lane, but is extra dramatic, so he summons his own personal audience. The murder munchers face the music after riding in on their smoke ponies. Some double down on insisting they are still totally evil, and some just resort to groveling. Meanwhile, Harry just hangs out and lets the most evil wizard in the room monologue till his non-existent heart's content. Wormtail cries like a bitch until promises are fulfilled, and his reward is at hand. And despite being otherwise perfect, Voldy's eyes still have a seeing everything but red. During episode 108, have some dignity, man. Our Potter pondering was, what are your thoughts on all of the backstory that the movie left out of this section, particularly about what Voldy was up to during his power outage? Also, what were your first impressions of Voldemort physically? Hi, Ellen and Katie. This is Ashley with this week's Potter Pondering. I really like Moldy Voldy. I don't know. I don't know why. I have no idea why he does it to me. But the extraness is just, it, it serves every time. Every time. I don't know. I don't even think I get too much of that vibe from him in the book, but movie Voldy definitely builds upon that extraness every movie after this, especially the next one. And you're right, it does get better and better. But at this point, are we surprised that they leave and shit out the movie? They don't want us to know what really happens. They're not telling us because they told their own damn story. They didn't have nothing to do with Voldemort's backstory. That's why we didn't get that information because it didn't matter to Newell. Ugh. Hello there. It is the support badger calling in my Potter pondering for this week. I just also want to say happy Thanksgiving to everybody because I know today's Thanksgiving in America here. So happy Thanksgiving to everybody. And I'm going to talk about what I think about Voldemort and my first impressions of him. So my first impressions of Voldemort was, what have you been doing with all your time that your toes and your nails are not clean? Disgusting. (laughs) And I hate that they leave his back because it makes it really confusing for people who only watch the movies to understand, like, all that Voldemort is. Obviously, I have a lot of issues with specifically this movie and the, like, next few movies about leaving important information out because there are people who don't necessarily enjoy reading but still want to enjoy the movies. And if you leave stuff like that out, the movies can can become confusing. So those are my first impressions of Voldemort. I'm sad that they left out his backstory especially because you don't really understand once it gets to the seventh movie, they're talking about Albania and you're like, why are they talking about Albania? I'm confused. But yeah, I'm really hoping that when we get to the fifth one, things will be better, even though I know they won't. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Hey, Ellen. Hey, Katie. Jackson here. So my opinion on the backstory, um, Being left out, yeah, as usual, I thought it was missing out severely, you know. the Honestly, all this stuff is crucial to Voldemort because, you know, we learn so much about him in the books, including what he thinks happened with his parents and then what actually happened later and 
then we learn none of what he thinks is true is actually true. So, yeah, you know, we, we're just going to end up saying this so much. Fucking knew all. And as for the physical aspect of Voldemort, yeah, he was pretty much as I imagined him. I, aside from the small errors, like I said last time, aside from the small errors, yeah, pretty much how I pictured him. Although, one thing that I don't know about the nails and the nasty-ass feet, I mean... <laughs> anyway, thanks, guys. Thank you so much for your responses. Our trivia question last week was, What does Harry hear coming from the thread of the light-spun web vibrating around him and Voldemort? Harry hears the Phoenix song, and it helps to give him hope and strength to hold on to the connection. Congratulations goes to Jackson Miller. Woohoo! He did get his streak started back up, now at two weeks in a row. Will Mike let him keep it up? We shall see. But for now, let's just keep rolling into Chapter 34, Priori Incantatum, and the corresponding film scenes. Chapter 34, Priori Incantatum As Wormtail approaches him, Harry scrambles to find his feet so they will support him before the ropes are untied. Wormtail pulls out the gag and raises his new silver hand to slice right through the bonds in one swipe. Harry briefly considers making a run for it, but his injured leg shakes under him and the Death Eaters close ranks to make a tighter circle around him and Voldemort. Wormtail walks towards Cedric's body and retrieves Harry's wand, which he thrusts into his hand without looking at him, then joins the circle. Voldemort softly asks Harry if he's been taught how to duel, and Harry briefly thinks about learning Expelliarmus at the dueling club two years ago, knowing there's no way that's going to help him against Voldemort, especially not surrounded by Death Eaters too. He knows he's facing Avada Kedavra, and that his mother is not there to die for him this time. Voldemort instructs him in the niceties of a duel, telling him they bow to one another. He bends a little, but does not take his eyes off Harry, who refuses to bow, not wanting to let Voldemort play with him before killing him. Voldemort repeats that he said bow, and uses his wand to force Harry to bend forward as the Death Eaters all laugh. Voldemort raises his wand, removing the pressure on Harry, telling him very good, and now he faces him like a man, straight back and proud, the way his father died. He starts the duel, and before Harry can do anything, Voldemort hits him with the Cruciatus Curse again, consuming Harry in an intense pain and causing him to scream more loudly than he ever has in his life. The pain stops when Voldemort decides to give him a break, asking Harry if that hurts, and assuming he didn't want him to do it again. Harry refuses to answer. He isn't going to play along or beg. Voldemort casts Imperio on Harry to force him to answer, leaving him feeling blissfully blank as a little voice encourages him to just say no. But a stronger voice says that he won't answer, and the internal struggle ends with Harry screaming out that he won't. It echoes around the graveyard and the Death Eaters stop laughing as Voldemort quietly tells Harry that he needs to learn obedience. He lifts his wand again, but this time Harry dodges the curse and rolls behind the marble headstone belonging to Voldemort's father. Voldemort tells him that they are not playing hide-and-seek and wonders if this means he's tired of their duel and wants him to finish it now. He tries to convince him to come out, saying it will be quick and maybe even painless. Harry knows the end has come and decides that he's not going to die crouching like a child playing hide-and-seek. He stands up before Voldemort reaches him, grips his wand, and throws himself around the headstone shouting, Expelliarmus. At the exact same time, Voldemort yells Avada Kedavra, and the jet of green light from his wand meets the red light that blasts from Harry's. A narrow stream of golden light connects the two wands, and Harry's wand starts vibrating and locks his hand in place around it. He looks across the beam and sees Voldemort's wand is also shaking and vibrating. Then, without warning, Harry feels his feet lift from the ground as he and the Dark Wizard are both being lifted into the air, 
their wands connected by the thread of shimmering golden light. The Death Eaters begin shouting for instructions, some pulling out their wands. The golden light splinters and crisscrosses around them, creating a dome-shaped web that acts like a cage of light keeping the Death Eaters out. Voldemort yells for them to do nothing unless he commands them, and struggles to break the connection between their wands. Harry holds on more tightly, using both hands, and keeps the connection unbroken. He then hears an unearthly and beautiful sound coming from the web, a phoenix song. It sounds like hope to him, and he feels as though it is inside him rather than around him. He connects it with Dumbledore, and it is almost like a friend is speaking to him. Don't break the connection. Harry knows he mustn't, but the moment he thinks it, it becomes even more difficult to hold on to. His wand is vibrating more powerfully than ever, and the beam of light between him and Voldemort has changed too, showing large beads of light sliding up and down the thread between the wands. The closest bead of light moves nearer to Harry's wand tip, and the wood becomes so hot he thinks it might burst into flame. He's worried it won't survive coming in contact with the bead of light, and concentrates every part of his mind towards forcing the bead back towards Voldemort. As it moves away from Harry and closer to Voldemort's wand, the Dark Lord looks astonished, almost fearful, as his wand starts to vibrate extra hard. Harry continues to concentrate harder than he ever has before and forces the bead of light to connect with Voldemort's wand. Immediately, the wand begins to emit echoing screams of pain, and then, to Voldemort's surprise, a dense, smoky hand flies out of the wand and vanishes. More shouts of pain, and another, much larger, dense, smoky figure emerges from the wand, and it is Cedric Diggory, looking like a solid gray ghost. Harry might have released his wand in shock then, but instinct told him to hold on, and he clutches it tightly as Cedric looks up at him and tells him to hold on. More screams, and another shadowy figure comes out of Voldemort's wand, this one of the old man that Harry had seen in a dream. He pushes out of the wand and falls next to Cedric, surveying the scene before him. He sees Voldemort and acknowledges that he was a real wizard who killed him, and tells Harry to fight him. Then another head comes out of the wand, and the shadow of Bertha Jorkins falls next to the other two. Her echoing voice calls for Harry not to let go, and the three shadowy figures begin pacing around the inner walls of the golden web. Another head emerges and Harry knows who it is, new from the moment he had seen Cedric emerge from the wand. It is a woman with long hair who looks at Harry. As he looks back into his mother's face, she tells him that his father is coming, hold on for his father. And then the tall and untidy-haired man blossoms from the end of Voldemort's wand, falls to the ground, and straightens himself. He walks close to Harry and quietly tells him that once the connection is broken, they can linger for only moments, but can give him time to get to the port key to return him to Hogwarts. He asks if Harry understands, and Harry gasps that he does, fighting to keep his grip on his wand. Cedric whispers to Harry, too, asking him to take his body back to his parents, and Harry says that he will. His father then tells him to do it now and be ready to run. Harry yells, Now! Unable to hold on any more anyway. He pulls his wand upward and breaks the golden thread, causing the web to vanish and the phoenix song to end. But the shadowy figures still linger and close in on Voldemort to block Harry from his gaze. Harry takes off running, dodging graves and curses from the Death Eaters. He nearly makes it to Cedric's body, but has to dive behind a marble angel to avoid being stunned. He dashes out from behind the angel and casts impedimenta as he runs the rest of the way towards Cedric. He grabs his wrist and points his wand towards the Triwizard Cup, yelling, Axio. The cup soars towards him and he catches it by the handle, hearing Voldemort scream of fury at the same moment he feels the familiar jerk behind his navel. In a whirl of wind and color, Cedric along with him, they're going back. The movie section starts out with Harry retrieving his wand from the ground at Voldemort's orders and getting to his feet. Voldemort tells Harry that he assumes he has learned how to duel and instructs him to first bow as he lowers his head, telling Harry that the niceties must be observed, as Dumbledore wouldn't want Harry to forget his manners. Harry just remains standing across from him, looking apprehensive as he tries to catch his breath. 
Voldemort again tells Harry to bow, but this time he uses his wand and forces him to bend at the waist. Harry moans as he tries to resist, and then Voldemort lunges at him and knocks him to the ground before casting Crucio on him. Voldemort watches as Harry writhes in pain on the ground and then releases the spell, telling him that his parents would be proud, especially his filthy muggle mother. Harry attempts to cast Expelliarmus on the Dark Wizard, but Voldemort parries it easily as he walks towards the boy and casually informs him that he is going to kill him. He squats down in front of him and lets him know that after tonight, no one will ever again question his power, and if they speak of Harry at all, it will only be about how he begged for death. Harry looks up at Voldemort with fear in his eyes as he continues saying that he, being a merciful lord, obliged. He tells Harry to get up and holds his hand out to magic him into an upright position. When he turns his back to resume a dueling distance, Harry uses the opportunity to dart behind a headstone. Voldemort turns back around and yells at Harry Potter to not turn his back on him, as he casts a jet of green light towards him and breaks part of the headstone. The camera focuses on Harry's face as Voldemort continues shouting that he wants him to look at him while he kills him, because he wants to see the light leave his eyes. As Harry processes these words, he takes a couple of deep breaths and steals himself against what is coming. With a look of determination, he stands himself up and steps out from behind the headstone, slowly walking right towards Voldemort and saying, Have it your way. He lifts his wand, and at the exact moment that he yells Expelliarmus, Voldemort calls Avada Kedavra. A jet of red light shoots from Harry's wand and meets with Voldemort's green light, connecting in the middle in a blaze of sparkling golden light. At first, the ball of light moves towards Harry, causing his wand to vibrate so much he needs to grip it with both hands. He then focuses on the blazing light and forces it towards Voldemort, who begins to scream to his Death Eaters to do nothing because the boy is his. The golden ball of light settles between them as they struggle and glows brighter before casting out streams of smoky light that arc up and over and form into ghostly figures. First of Cedric Diggory, then another of an old man. A third and fourth stream glides towards Harry and manifests on either side of him as his mother and father. His father's voice tells him he must get to the port key once the connection is broken, saying they will linger for a moment to give him some time, but only a moment. Harry nods when he asks if he understands, and the ghostly Cedric asks Harry to take his body back to his father. Harry nods again and looks back at Voldemort, who is still focused on beating Harry. Before anything else can happen, Harry's mom tells him that he's ready and to let go. He screams as he jerks his wand upward and then runs toward Cedric's body as the phantom figures charge toward Voldemort. Harry yells Accio and points his wand at the Triwizard Cup, causing it to fly toward him. The second it touches his hand, he and Cedric's body disappear in a swirl, and Voldemort runs towards the spot where he had been before screaming, No! Because Harry Potter got away again. 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 I liked your no. Thanks. I also love how I just have lowercase n-o, and you did the whole voice. <laughs> did the whole... I mean... Is it even worth it if I don't go all, all out? I considered spelling it out with like capital letters, N O O, but I didn't commit, so I'm glad you did. You know what? One of us has to. So <laughs> usually it's you. So I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I think this is another one of those times where the book is actually more dramatic than the movie, though. Yeah. Yeah. There are also a few minor differences, but really, for the most part, the movie is just a far less detailed version of the book. It's true. Which is what we want. Yeah. Usually. I don't mind if it follows it almost exactly and just leaves out the recappy details or the ones that wouldn't translate to film very well. Mm-hmm. Exactly. As we pointed out last week, it's Wormtail who retrieves Harry's wand for him in the book and then releases him. Mm-hmm. So that's where it's starting right here. And Harry's desperately trying to touch his feet to the ground so he can actually stand when he is untied. And Wormtail just uses his hand to slice right through the ropes with one swoop. 
and I've never been sure if it's like an Edward Scissorhand moment and he's got some sharp ass fingers or if it's just something magical about the hand that undoes the binding since he tied him up with conjured bonds. I mean, maybe he just really quickly read the instruction manual and figured it out. Maybe so, it's intuitive. Maybe. I've always wondered about that. It's like a cartoon hand that just changes to whatever he needs at any given time. Right. I like that idea. Yeah. Just because I want him to make it into a mallet or something. <laughs> a knife. Yes. But in the movie, the only bond was the way that the statue held him in place. But we already talked about how Voldy released him from that last week. So. Yeah. Harry has a brief moment where he considers getting the fuck out of there. Like anyone would. Right. But between his injured leg and the murder muncher's closing ranks to block any path he could have found, he's pretty much fucked. Yeah. The movie, however, starts out a little differently, though. With Harry scrambling to get his wand as Voldy orders him to get it and get to his feet. Like, he's kind of a bossy little bitch, isn't he? Kind of? I mean, that is kind of the name of the game, so yes. Yep. But... Like I mentioned, it's Wormtail who gets Harry's wand from near Cedric's body, and then he just forces it into Harry's hand without looking at him because dude knows that he is a rat bastard. Mm-hmm. And then Voldemort does that horrifying thing where he speaks in a soft voice. It's far more scary than yelling at someone. It's always the calm before the storm that's the scariest. Yeah. Especially if you don't know if the storm is coming. Right. But when you do know the storm is coming... And they're speaking softly at you. You're just like, shit is about to go down. Mm -hmm. But he asks Harry if he knows how to duel. And Harry somehow manages to work his brain, despite everything going on, and accesses a memory about learning Expelliarmus at the otherwise useless dueling club from two years ago. Mm -hmm. He's also clear-headed enough to realize that there is no way that's going to help him against Voldemort. Especially not while also outnumbered by the surrounding murder munchers. It's impressive. Yeah, I gotta tell you, Harry is good under pressure. Mm -hmm. He is well aware that he's facing Avada Kedavra and that since his mother is not there to die for him, he's probably dead. And he can still think clearly. That's impressive. Yeah. This is quite similar in the movie. Old Moldy Voldy uh, assumes that Harry knows how to duel, which... Thanks to Lockhart's impeccable and in-depth instruction two friggin' years ago, he is somewhat right. Somewhat. Somewhat. He's not wrong. No. But he sarcastically comments that he wouldn't want Dumbledore to think Harry had forgotten his manners by not bowing and observing the standard niceties. I gotta say, I am interested in when they would have learned had Lockhart not set up the dueling club. Because the way Voldemort says it, in the movie at least, he says it like, oh yeah, you know how to duel, right? Like, like it was just assumed that he knew. In the book, he asks, but in the movie, he's like, you know how to duel. Right. Of course you do. You're 14. You must know how to handle your wand. Your wand. <laughs> You're welcome. That's what she said. Anyway, just keep rolling. But I mean, seriously, though, is it a standard lesson that's taught in Defense Against the Dark Arts? Like, I I'm just not sure how I feel about that. See, that is a good question, because I think it would be normal to learn that in Defense Against the Dark Arts. Yeah. If the teacher isn't a complete and total appendix. Well, there's that. Because let's be honest, Quirrell was kind of useless by that point. Mm-hmm. He also had never taught Defense Against the Dark Arts before, so even with Voldy in his head, I'm not sure he necessarily mm. knew what he was doing, and first year probably isn't the year they would teach dueling anyway. Exactly. And then you get the Appendix Lockhart. Yeah. And he definitely had no idea what he was doing. He was totally just in it to make himself look good. That's all it was. Right. And I'm positive that Lupin knew exactly what he was doing, but the third year curriculum didn't allow for it maybe. yeah focused on creatures yeah i just don't i don't know how i would feel about my kid learning how to tool in school i mean i know they have like fencing in schools and stuff yeah but you're not always gonna carry a rapier on you you know yes. whereas kids always have a wand on them at hogwarts but maybe it's like that martial arts thing where not only are you learning how to defend yourself you are learning the discipline that comes with knowing when to defend yourself that's possible yeah but this could also be a good potter pondering when do you think 
the students learn how to duel or if they even do. Yeah. Just a random side note, really. Yeah. But again, we have a similarity to the book because Book Voldemort also brings up the niceties of a duel, instructing Harry to bow, and even making the comment about Dumbledore wanting Harry to show manners. I mean, you always have to show your manners. He's probably not wrong either. No. In a real duel, yes. Yeah. Voldy actually even bends a little himself Mm -hmm. in sort of a bow, but he keeps his eyes on Harry the whole time, who's now starting to show a little sass, and refuses to even nod. Yeah. Harry just kind of stands there in the movie, too, refusing to bow. He's just like, "Uh uh-uh. And it's either out of caution or insolence. I'm not quite sure. But he tries to catch his breath while that's going on, because... Yeah. It could be all three. He's being cautious, he's being insolent, and he's trying to catch his breath, so he's not going to bend at the waist yet. Right, he's got it all going on at once right now. (laughs) It's an intense moment. It is. Voldemort, however, is having none of his shit, because why would he? He's Voldemort. (laughs) And he tells him once again to bow, this time using his wand to force Harry to bend at the waist and bow like a good little bitch. This is, like, so crazy similar to the book. What? Ding! Because Book Voldy repeats his order to bow and uses his wand to force Harry to bend forward, which the murder munchers find hilarious. I kind of wish we would have had, like, a murder muncher laugh. Right? In the movie. They were just there. Yeah. Even if it was just a ha ha. (laughs) (laughs) Just one guy, just crab, just ha ha. (laughs) Exactly. That's what I need in my life. Voldy then raises his wand, taking the pressure off Harry, and patronizes him, complimenting the bow that he forced him into. Man. He then verbally starts the duel, like, let's duel, telling Harry to face him like a man, straight back and proud, like his father. Ooh. That's cutting him to the quick right there. Yeah. Bringing up his dad now. In the movie, Harry groans and tries to keep himself up just as Voldy lunges at him knocking him to the ground and hitting him with a high-pitched crucial. <laughs> That's what he does. I know. He's like... I just love your impression. <laughs> I'm glad they amuse you. Gleefully, the pale-ass lord watches Harry squirm under the curse before giving him a small respite. It's interesting because he starts the curse off with crucio and he ends it with crucio. He says Crucio again to stop it. Is that what he said? Yeah. I thought it was something else, but it's hard to understand. Well, he because he does his Crucio. <laughs> like, Maybe it was Crucion? Crucio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, episode title. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just didn't think that you would take a spell and start it and end it with the same thing but newell newell (laughs) (laughs) but he then pokes the bear by putting the potter's names in his mouth telling harry how proud they'd be especially his filthy muggle mommy which is only similar to the book with a reference to harry's parents though it isn't in the same way Mm -hmm. but the duel otherwise starts similarly though without the lunge that knocks harry to the ground Mm -hmm. However, Voldemort did hit him with the Cruciatus curse for the second time in the book. Harry ends up on the ground, screaming like he's never screamed before because the Cruciatus curse is awful. Like it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But because Voldy has been waiting for this moment for 13 years. I did my waiting! 13 years of it! In In Albania! Albania! (laughs) I'm glad you came with me on that. (laughs) How do I not? I mean, it's just so fun. But yeah, all that time waiting, he wants to savor this moment. So he releases the curse, Crucy off, (laughs) and states the obvious. That hurt, didn't it? No, asshole, I was screaming because it tickled. Please, sir, may I have another? And because he's super perceptive, Voldy also says, you don't want me to do that again, do you? (laughs) Harry's actual response to this is pretty badass because he just doesn't say anything. I love that. I know. If it were me in that situation, it would go a lot like the torture scene from The Princess Bride. You don't want me to do that again, do you? (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) Definitely. And then, because Voldy has major control issues, he uses Imperio to force Harry to answer. 
Unfortunately for old Moldy Voldy, Harry's been training for this moment his whole fourth year at school <laughs> and is able to ignore the little voice telling him to just say no. Instead, he yells, I won't! I mean, that's still an answer, technically. But, but he did not answer the question. That is true. This actually effectively stops the murder munchers laughing. So that's cool. Right. But it also makes Voldy do the quiet voice again and tell him that he needs to learn obedience. That was creepy. It's that quiet voice. I'm telling you. I know. That was really creepy. Please don't do that. Why not? Because it's a bit different in the movie and I just want to move on. <laughs> just keep rolling. Mm hmm. Harry makes a sad but brave little attempt to disarm Voldy, but his new body is just a smidgen too agile for the boy. And he easily dodges it and makes his way towards him, informing him that he is about to die. And when he is killed, not one little bitch is ever going to doubt Voldy's power and virility ever again, since the best way to prove that is to kill a teenager. He goes on to say that Harry won't even be remembered except for being a screaming little bitch who was no match for the big, bad, pale dude in a nightgown. You're paraphrasing. I am. Harry looks scared shitless as Voldy tells him that since he's such a decent lord and master, he'll do the right thing and put Harry out of his misery. Which is really what all evil guys say, isn't it? I believe it's in the handbook. It must be. It's in the script. <laughs> <laughs> He once again orders the boy to get up and resume the duel, but since Harry isn't completely stupid, he takes the fuck off, darting behind a nearby headstone. This lines back up with the book, because when Voldy lifts his wand to teach Harry some obedience, Harry dodges the curse and rolls behind Voldy's dad's headstone. What? Ding! Voldy informs him that they are not playing hide-and-seek, and assumes that Harry must be tired of their duel and just wants to be killed now. If I'm not lying, that would be me. <laughs> just kill me now. I feel like just do it. <laughs> just get it over with, would you? <laughs> In the movie, Voldemort sees Harry run and shouts at him not to turn his back on him. He casts a jet of green light his way and misses Harry by inches but crumbles the section of headstone that it strikes. We see Harry panting as Voldy continues taunting him, saying that he wants to see the lights leave his eyes when he kills him. When it comes to trying to talk Harry out from behind the headstone, book Voldy is almost convincing compared to the movie. Well, the movie, he just shouts. <laughs> Come out, Potter. I want to see the light leave your eyes. Yeah. Not a good argument. I want to watch you die. Come here. <laughs> That's almost as convincing as, oh my God, this smells disgusting. Here, you smell. Exactly. <laughs> But in the book, Voldy promises that it will be quick and maybe even painless. Oh, well. That's almost enticing compared to what movie Voldy says. Yeah. But he also goes on to say that, you know, maybe even painless. But I don't know. I've never died. <laughs> Yet, motherfucker. Yeah, give it time. <laughs> Harry knows that he doesn't have many options and refuses to die like a child playing hide and seek. So he stands up before Voldy can reach him grips his wand, and shouts Expelliarmus as he throws himself around the headstone. At this exact moment, Voldy yells, Avada Kedavra! And his green-lighted curse meets Harry's red-lighted spell midair, and it creates a narrow stream of golden light that connects the two wands. Well, again, it is very similar to the movie. Harry decides that if he's gonna go down, it won't be cowering behind a tombstone. He is Harry motherfucking Potter, and he is going to give this megalomaniacal fuck the duel he wants. He may only really know one spell, but fuck it. He is done with this tomfoolery. Yeah. See what I did there? <laughs> and with that, he stands, makes his way around the tombstone, heads directly for the amoeba of evil where Voldy stands, and says, have it your way. He holds up his wand and shouts Expelliarmus at the same time Voldemort lifts his and hollers Avada Kedavra! Red light shoots out of Harry's wand as green light shoots out of Voldemort's. Clashing dead center between them, both lights turn a brilliant white and begin shooting some kind of white jizz all over the place. I don't understand it. It's weird. This movie is just chock full of jizz-like substances. I'm just saying. Like... Coming of age indeed. Except coming is spelled the wrong way. Well, they don't know that, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little different in the book since it's not like a white jizz type substance. Like they made it 
more sparky. It like yeah. flared out a lot in the movie, whereas the book was describing it as this very fine golden thread. Yeah. Which that's what I was picturing more of, but whatever. But no, it got your classily put white jizz. And then also in the book, both of their wands start shaking and vibrating so hard they're having a hard time holding on to them. They sort of show that in the movie. Eh, eh. Not on Voldemort's part. No. He's like perfectly calm, just handling it like, I don't know. Like he does. Like he does. (laughs) Yes. But the ball of light goes back and forth between the two for a minute. Harry grips his wand with both hands to retain better control over it, and the ball begins to move towards Voldemort, who yells to the murder munchers to do nothing because the boy is his to finish off. Like, for real, I don't even need to write the jokes for this scene. The source material is dirty just all by itself. I mean, you can find dirty jokes in nearly anything. I can, but I don't have to look very hard (laughs) in this. I'm just saying. Fair. Book Voldemort also does yell at the murder munchers to do nothing, but he says, unless he commands them. Mm -hmm. But this is actually because he and Harry are lifted from the ground by the connection in their wands. They are like floating midair now. And the murder munchers are kind of like freaking out, like, what do we do? What do we do? And Voldemort's (laughs) like, don't do anything unless I tell you. (laughs) And then that same golden light starts to splinter from the original thread, but it's not really in that sparky, crazy sense. It's more individual threads that end up creating this whole elaborate dome-shaped golden web that creates a full barrier that actually blocks out the murder munchers. Mm Mm-hmm. That sounds just awesome. Yeah, I really would have rather to see it that way. Yeah. Harry has to adjust his grip on his wand again and uses both hands. Mm -hmm. So it is similar to the movie there in that one little aspect at this point. But he's struggling to keep that connection unbroken when he hears the Phoenix song coming from the connection. Which was our trivia question. Yep. He associates the sound to Dumbledore and to Hope. And it feels as if it's within him instead of all around him. And it seems to be telling him not to break the connection. He actually tells the song he knows and he won't. I I always wondered, is he saying that out loud? Like, I know I won't. Or is he just thinking it? (laughs) It'd be great if it was right after Voldemort said, don't do anything unless I command you. And he's like, I know I won't. I know I won't. (laughs) What? (laughs) But anyway, the moment that he acknowledges that he knows he can't break that connection, it becomes even harder to hold that connection. Mm -hmm. And he just has to, like, redouble his grip onto his wand because it's vibrating so hard. At this point, the golden beam of light that's connecting them has kind of altered, too. But instead of it just being, like, the one light Mm -hmm. in the movie, it has multiple beads of light running along the whole golden thread. Mm -hmm. And the one that's closest to Harry is what is making his wand shake more. And the closer it gets, it starts to make his wand feel hot to the touch. Which, I mean, it's kind of like the ball of light in the movie. Yeah. I mean, we don't know if it made his wand hot to the touch, but kind of? It's just not how I pictured it, though. No, it's really not. I guess it's similar enough. Yeah. But the movie obviously also can't give us Harry's inner monologue in the kind of detail the book includes. Mm -hmm. Because we also know that Harry thinks the bead of light is going to destroy his wand if it touches it. And that's why he starts trying to force it towards Voldemort's wand. I mean, that's a logical assumption to make. And being as strong-willed as he is, it does actually work and starts moving closer to Voldy. Well, there you go. Which shocks the shit out of the Dark Lord, because for as arrogant as he is, he has no fucking clue what's going on. (laughs) And since Harry is typically clueless, he ultimately is nowhere near as out of his element as old Moldy Voldy is. (laughs) Yeah, Harry's just like, this is par for the course. I have no idea what's going on, but... You have no idea what's going on, and that's going to suck for you. Yeah. (laughs) I never have any idea what's going on. This is just normal. Right? (laughs) Welcome to my life. Mm -hmm. Harry continues to concentrate harder than he ever has before and manages to force the bead of light to connect with Voldy's wand, which starts to emit echoing screams of pain. And then, to Voldy's continuing surprise, a dense, smoky hand flies out of the wand and vanishes. The movie basically lines up to this, but they don't start with the hand. 
Instead, Voldemort continues to insist that Harry is his as the ball of light shoots out wisps of smoky light that form a dome over the dueling enemies. And then we see some fucking ghosts. Yeah. In a wispy dome. And... Not really a golden web. No. I wish it were a golden web. Me too. This was just... uh, Underwhelming. But the ghosts were there. But yes, the ghosts were there. First, that of Cedric Diggory, the most recent victim of Voldy's wand. And then a random old dude who isn't really that random, but is Frank Bryce, the old guy who was killed in the beginning of the movie. And that is straight from the book, because Mm -hmm. we also see them both after the ghost hand, which was the spell that Voldemort cast to create the hand for Wormtail. Ah, forgot about that already. Hmm. Yeah, that's the Priorian Cantatum, which we'll end Mm -hmm. up talking more about, but it's literally goes through all of the spells that Voldemort most recently did, which is why they felt the need to teach us about Priori Incantatum earlier on in this book, so we knew what was happening. Yes. I think those beads of light running along the golden thread were all of the different spells that could potentially have been released, depending on which one forced the other. Yeah. That's what I think. It would have been really great if the hand came out and just smacked Voldy. (laughs) (laughs) But like I said, we also see... Cedric and Frank Bryce, and they both tell Harry to hold on. But Frank Bryce also has this cute little moment where he realizes that the guy that killed him was, in fact, a real wizard. (laughs) He's like, you fight him. Killed me, that one. You fight him. (laughs) Yeah, our Frank didn't say shit. No. We didn't even know he was Frank. Yeah. We also get to see Bertha Jorkin's ghostly figure come out of the wand. And she also tells Harry not to let go. So that's just the theme of this. Mm Mm-hmm exorcism i don't (laughs) (laughs) i'm noticing a pattern in this haunting right don't let go Mm -hmm. the three shadowy figures then basically pace around the inside of the golden web and i think that was more to just freak out the murder munchers i mean that would make sense but we don't see bertha jorkins in the movie it's like not at all Not not with a body not as a ghost not as nothing not even named nope no bertha Sorry, honey. But then it does basically line back up after that, so... Yeah. When another head starts to emerge from the tip of Voldy's wand, Mm -hmm. Harry knows exactly who this one is, because he knew he'd be seeing her from the moment he had seen Ghostly Cedric. Because he's pretty smart for being as clueless as he can be. Well, he's good under pressure. Yeah. And it doesn't get much more pressure-filled than this. Yeah. But without a doubt, he knows it's his mother. Mm Mm-hmm. She tells Harry to hold on because his father is coming and wants to see him. And fun fact, if you have the original print of this book, at least in the American version, Mm -hmm. it actually has his father come out first. And since that messed with the order that Voldemort killed them in and how his spells would then come out of the wand, they fixed it in later editions. Mm -hmm, Because they fucked it up pretty hard. Sure (laughs) did. But since we're taking our summaries from the fixed version, we see Harry's mom first. Yep. And then we see the tall man with untidy hair like Harry's blossom from the end of Voldemort's wand. And that is something that I'd say is a definite difference from the way the book described it to how the movie did it. Mm -hmm. They were like blooming out of it in the book. It's like you could see first their head, then their shoulders, then their torso. And they like literally like blossomed out of it like that word just described. Yeah. And then they fell to the ground and stood up and tidied themselves, whereas they were much more ghostly in the film. Yeah, they kind of just shot out of the wand in like a wispy kind of mist and then take shape once they get towards Harry, more than less. Yeah. And they do kind of just keep floating, whereas in the book, they are these like solid looking, almost corporeal, but shadow forms. Mm Mm-hmm. And they actually walk across the ground. They're not floating around like ghosts. Yeah, this was just busts almost. Yeah. And the rest was all smoky. But Harry's dad walks close to Harry and quietly tells him that once the connection is broken, they can linger for only moments, but it will give him time to get to the port key to return him to Hogwarts. He asks if Harry understands, and Harry gasps that he does, still fighting to keep his grip on his wand. Well, yeah. Cedric also whispers to Harry, asking him to take his body back to his parents, and Harry says that he will. His father then tells him to do it now and be ready to run. 
And Harry yells, now! And he's unable to hold on anymore anyway, so good timing. Right? Which, I mean, the last part is basically how it goes in the movie, too. So there's that. Yeah. Following directly after Frank Bryce and landing on either side of Harry are his parents. His dad tells him that he needs to haul ass back to the port key and they'll hang back and try to hold off Captain Murder Muncher for a little bit, but it's only going to last a moment, so he needs to run like his balls are on fire. His dad asks if he understands and Harry nods as Dedrick begs for Harry to take his body back with him. You know, as a gift for his dad. Which is slightly different because it was only his dad in the movie and it was his parents in the book. Yeah. Well, we know his mom isn't at Hogwarts in the movie, so. Right, but she was there in the books. Yes, she was. But Harry nods at this request as well and looks back at Voldemort, who is utterly focused on murdering a teenager. You know, like he does. Mm Mm-hmm. I think we've all been there at one point or another in our lives, haven't we? I mean, I teach middle school. (laughs) You get it. (laughs) See? Before Harry can chicken out, his mom gives him a non-corporeal nudge, telling him that he is ready and it's time to let go. Which was his dad in the book, so slight difference there, too. But I guess they had to give Lily something to say. Right. Since she's supposed to be the important one here. (laughs) With a large amount of effort, he jerks his wand upward and then takes off towards Cedric's body. The wispy dead people all charge at Voldemort, causing hella confusion amongst the murder munchers and their fearless leader. In the book, he also pulls his wand up to break the connection. And though the web vanishes and the phoenix song ends, the ghostly figures still linger and close in on Voldemort to block Harry from view. So that was done pretty similarly. Yeah. I'm a little bummed we didn't get the phoenix song. Definitely. But what else? I would have preferred that. And I would have preferred them not to be like a smoke cloud going at Voldemort, but... Yeah, they like rushed him. Yeah. But anyway, there are a few more details to Harry's escape in the book. He takes off running and has to dodge several curses along the way, which that part is similar. But mm-hmm. he's also dodging the headstones. And then at one point, he is actually not even at Cedric's body yet. And he nearly gets hit by stupefied and has to full on dive behind a marble angel in order to avoid it. And that was not in the movie. No. He just ran straight there. Yeah, it was slightly more dramatic than the movie. Which is rare, but it happens. That is true. It does. Occasionally. He then dashes back out and casts Impedimenta as he runs the rest of the way towards Dedrick. Does actually manage to hit somebody, but he does not stop to look who it is. He just keeps on going. Mm-hmm. Makes it to Cedric, grabs his wrist, and points his wand towards the quad wizard cup, yelling, Axio! Thank God we learned that spell this year, huh? Right? (laughs) The cup soars towards him and he catches it by the handle, hearing Voldemort's scream of fury at the same moment he feels that familiar jerk from behind his navel. That's such a descriptive way to say something. Right? It kind of makes me like grab my belly button whenever I I hear it. I do. Every single time I read it out loud, I like touch my stomach. (laughs) But in a whirl of wind and color, Dedrick along with him, they're on their way back. Which is... Then back to being very similar to the movie. So yay. Ding. Harry points his wand at the quad wizard cup and shouts, Akio, which makes the cup zoom towards him. The moment he touches it, both boys are transported away in the blink of an eye. Once able to get past his apparitional roadblock, Voldy and the other murder munchers sprint over to catch Harry, but he is long gone. And Voldemort and his tiny teeth scream, No! Because he done fucked up again. Again. Mm-hmm. Dude can't catch a break. Or a Harry Potter, for that matter. <laughs> no luck there. Mm-mm. We could technically talk about Harry's parents being actors in this scene, but they didn't really do much. Yeah. So we're just going to say they looked like they could have been Harry's parents. <laughs> <laughs> Yay for you guys. They fit the role. Yep. We'll talk a little bit more about them when we actually get a bit more from them in other scenes. Yes. In later movies. But that'll bring us to this week's Potter Ponderings. Our first Potter Pondering was, how do you think Wormtail's hand was able to cut through the bindings? And when, if ever, do you think the Hogwarts students learn how to duel? Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. Or... 
Call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. We really look forward to reading and hearing them. This will bring us to our sorting hat story, which is from Tammy Jo Whitley. She writes, I am a Hufflepuff. My wand is chestnut with unicorn hair core, and my Patronus is a lynx. I was 21 years old, and my 10-year-old stepbrother got the Order of the Phoenix for Christmas. I read the back cover, and it was intriguing. I borrowed the first four books from him. Then I had to wait for what seemed like forever for him to finish the fifth so I could borrow it. I purchased the book and was at the midnight release for every book after that. I remembered that it was rumored that Half-Blood Prince was the last book. I finished reading it in less than two days from the release. That ending and the wait for the next one, oh my god. I hope my kids someday get to experience midnight releases and anxiously waiting for the next book in a series. I'm currently homeschooling them. Outside of our core math and literature class, we are studying Harry Potter. We're reading the books together. In our theme classes, we are learning about astrology, geology, herbology, chemistry, and muggle history and arts and music, and cooking from a Harry Potter cookbook. We are using a house point system for classroom behavior. That's so awesome. I love everything about that so much. Mm -hmm. It very much reminds me of me waiting for my brother to finish the fourth book. Mm -hmm. So you could read it? Exactly. And then that wait. I remember that wait. Mm -hmm. But I love that she's sharing it with her kids. And then she's basically a teacher doing homeschooling. So it's neat that she gets to build a curriculum off of Harry Potter. I I love it. it. Thank you so much for sharing your Sorting Hat story with us, Tammy. Yes, thank you. And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your Sorting Hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might want to share with us. Or you can message it to us over social media. Or you can call it in. Or you can call it in. Mm Mm-hmm. This week's trivia question is, where does Moody say he is taking Harry after he gets back from the graveyard? The first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word, hashtag, come on now, will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. Make sure to check out our website at justkeeprolling.com and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you would like to help us continue creating more content, you can support us as a patron and get extra perks on patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And as this episode actually released on Thanksgiving, we just want to take a moment to wish everybody, our patrons, our keepers, people who just randomly dropped in, a very happy Thanksgiving. Yes. Of everything in this world, I think we're the most thankful for you guys. I actually am really thankful for this podcast and all of the amazing people that it has connected us to. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a highlight of my life. It really is. And, you know, two years ago, who'd have thought? (laughs) Right? So thank you to all of our keepers. You guys are the reason we keep doing this. Even if there is a holiday, we get the episodes out. Yep. That's how much we love you. And join us next week when we talk about the first half of Chapter 35, Veritaserum, and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just just keep keep rolling. rolling.